Hey guys, how we going? Um, I hope you uh, enjoy the hat that I'm rocking here. Uh, you go back to the early 90s and this was all the fashion. This was the trend. Um, I guess as we know though that um, trends don't last. Um, you don't see anyone rocking these beautiful hats uh, these days like they were back when uh, I was a little bit younger back in the 90s. Um, what we are going to do today though is talk about um, some trends and patterns that have lasted um, the test of time for want of a better word and they're the trends and the patterns of the periodic table. Now before we get started I just want to have a look at here we are this is um, the symbol for boron and this is exactly how we would see it on the periodic table. We've got our atomic number We've got um, our chemical symbol, the name boron, and then we've got this one here, which is the atomic mass number, all right? I'm going to talk about the atomic mass number. The atomic mass number can also be known as the average atomic mass, the relative atomic mass, and the atomic or atomic weight. Um, now, that is different to mass number. So when we're talking about mass number, we're generally talking about um, an isotope of a, a particular um, element and we dis when we talk about mass number we discuss the weight of that particular um, that particular isotope of um, boron for instance um, if you want to know more about that you need to watch the video atomic mass number versus mass number um, but it has to do with isotopes which you probably should have learned about by now all right our atomic mass oh sorry our atomic number we should know by now that the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. All right. Um, really, really importantly, the number of protons that are in the nucleus tell us what atom we're actually talking about or what element we're actually talking about. If it's got five protons, the atomic number for this is five because it's got five protons. Any single atom that has five protons is boron. And there are two different types of boron. So there's boron um, 10 and boron 11, which is the reason why we've got this 10.8, because this is an average weight or an av um, average weight of those two um, isotopes of boron as we would find them in nature. So their abundance in nature. All right, so we're just going to get that out of the way and we'll start talking about one of the first trends or patterns on the periodic table. Let's start with the basics. Okay, when we start talking about um, the periodic table, there are three different types of atoms in the periodic table. So let's just bring in the periodic table that I prepared earlier. All right, so here we are. We've got our periodic table here. Uh, as you can see, I've got them um, colored in a, a few different colors here. Uh, I've got red here, and we've got the red over here for hydrogen. All right, they are our non-metals, what we would class as non-metals. Let's just bring this in. Green, which are down the left hand side here and just along here, and then everything in here, all right, they're my metals, all right, and the ones that we deal with in here are what we class as transition metals. Um, we don't do a deal a lot with those in year nine, but you will in year 10 and year 11 and year 12 chemistry if you do it. Um, our blue are what's classed as metalloids, so they come all the way down here, all right. Now, depending on what periodic table that you look at, this one will either be a metal or a non-metal, um, they're still discussing on whether that should be classed as a metal or a non-metal. All right, um, and that's the best thing about science, you know, and until something can be proven beyond a doubt, there's always reason for it to be changed. So at the moment, depending on your periodic table, AT here, and I can't remember the name of the element, um, would be either a metal or a non-metal. So, What's the difference between these things and why is the table broken up like this? Like realistically, when we're looking at the trends and the patterns of the periodic table, we want to look at why is the periodic table shaped the way that it is? Why isn't it just a square box? You know, 20 long, 6 deep, that gets my 120 elements in it. Why can't it, why doesn't it just fit nice, neatly into a box? Well, that because it has something to do with some of the characteristics of the atoms on the periodic table. So let's have a look at some of the properties, what we would class the properties of non-metals and metals. So some properties of non-metals. They're dull, which means they're not shiny, so they're dull. They're brittle or they break or crumble. Um, so that just means if I go to snap them, it, it'll break, all right? It'll crumble in my hands. 
Um, they're poor conductors of heat and electricity, and that has to do with um, that has to do with their electrons. But we'll get into that later. Low melting point, so it doesn't take a high temperature to melt nonmetals. They form anions. All right. Now we've been talking about ions, but we've only been using the word ion. Um, and ions are what class a negative ion. So whenever you're talking about a negative ion, you'll call it an anion. Um, and they share electrons in covalent bonding. So if you've watched the, should have watched the metallic bonding by now um, and covalent bonding by now, you know that they share electrons. So it's not like in ionic bonding where they, um, where they will um, give away or take on electrons. Non-metals, when they come together, will actually share electrons. So when we come into the properties of they're shiny, all right? They're malleable. It means that they can bend. Malleable just means that they can bend, all right? They're good conductors of heat and electricity, all right? And when we talk about metals being good conductors of heat and electricity, that again links to uh, the way that the electrons float around in that electron C when we have metallic bonds. Um, they're solid at room temperature, except for mercury. Right, mercury is what we've always used for thermometers, okay, because they're, they're a liquid at um, room temperature, and as that gets warmer, it expands. If we go back to our, um, uh, what theory am I thinking of? Um, when we go back to our, oh, I've lost it, doesn't matter. Anyway, so mercury will expand um, as it gets warmer, and that's why we use it in thermometers. They form cations, all right? which are positive ions. So think of, you know, I'm a cat and I've got pores. So I'm a positive ion. I'm a positive ion. Um, they're ductile, which means they can be stretched, which is why all of our power lines and um, wiring within our houses and all that sort of stuff are from metals, right? One, because they're good conductors of heat and electricity, right? But two, because they're ductile. It means that they can be stretched and made into wires, all right? So there are properties of metals and non-metals. But what about our metalloids? Well, our metalloids are a special breed, right? Our metalloids here, this little staircase here, share properties of both, all right? So um, if I look at silicon, all right, silicon um, is not malleable, okay? Um, it can break and um, it doesn't bend very well, all right? But silicon is a great conductor of heat and electricity, or electricity at least. All right, so it's sharing some of the properties of non-metals and um, properties of metals. So these metalloids are special, um, special atoms in the fact that they share both um, characteristics of our metals and non-metals, and they make them very, very. You know, these elements here are really, really handy because they do share those different types of um, characteristics from metals and non-metals. All right, let's go on to our next trend. So let's talk a little bit about groups and periods. Now, you would have done a little bit about groups and periods already. I'm just going to get rid of this one here. You would have already done a little bit about groups and periods, all right, especially when you've done your Bohr models. All right, so let's look at groups and periods in a little bit more detail. So we'll start with, I'm going to start with periods first. So here we are. If I match this up, I've got my periods down the side here. Straighten that up a little bit. All right, so I've got my periods down the side here. I've got period one, I've got period two, three, four, all the way through to seven. All right, now as you can see in period one, we've only got the two elements. We've got hydrogen and helium. Period two, what have we got? Eight um eight elements, period three, eight elements. That once we get into period four, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, all right? Which is why we've got, you know, when we talk about groups, there are actually 18 groups, even though we've only been discussing eight of them. All right, so what do all of the atoms in a period have in common? If you've done the Bohr model, you should have already answered this question. All right, if I look at period one and I draw um, a nucleus in the middle, all right, but then I draw some electron shells, what you'll find is everything in period one only has one elect um, electron shell or one energy level. So if I looked at hydrogen, hydrogen's got one electron, helium's got two, all right? 
Now two is as much as you can fit in the first um, shell, um, but it only has one shell. If I look at period two, all of my elements in period two will have two shells, all right? So if I look at lithium, two shells. I look at neon, two shells. Lithium being number three, it's got one, two. It's got a, a, a third electron out here. If I look at neon, it's got the two, and then it's got a full valency shell of eight. All right, when I come down to three, three electron shells, all right? First one here, sodium, number 11. I've got two, I've got eight, and then I've got one out here. If I come down to here, uh, this would be R. It's got two, it's got eight, it's got eight, all right? But the thing that matters is for periods, I'm using three, um, I've got three energy levels, all right? It means I'm in period three. And that's the same for periods four, five, six, and seven. All right. Let's go to our groups. So let's bring this in here. I might put this up a little bit. Okay, so I've got my groups here. And as you can see, I've got it, I've labeled them a little bit differently. So I've got my 18 groups, one to 18, um, between three and 12 are our transition metals, right? We're not looking at the transition metals within, um, year nine science, all right? We're looking at the first two groups and the last six groups, all right? So we're going to list those groups as a, as group A, all right? So we've got group 1A, 2A, 3A through to 8A, all right? Now, when we're looking at these, what do all of these things have in common? So let's bring in our groups. So when I look at my groups, what does everything in each group have in common? Well, let's look at this. All right. I've got group one, group two, um, or group two A, six A, seven A, and eight A, which are groups 16, 17, and 18. Really important to realize that there are 18 groups. Um, but for now, we're going to call um, 13 through to 18, 3A through to 8A. All right, so if I look at group one, this is hydrogen, all right, hydrogen in group one, it's got one shell, the crosses indicate the electrons. You can see that there's only one electron there. If I come down to lithium, again, zinc one, it's number three, it's got two in its first shell, it's only got one in its valency, valency shell. Now remember, valency shell, really, really important holds the valence electrons, all right? These valency shells are the shell that is the furthest away from the nucleus. So number, if I come down to sodium here, all right, again, my outside shell, my valency shell only has one valence electron. If I come down here to potassium, again, you can see my outside shell, only one electron. If I look at group two, um, again, one and two. One and two, one and two, all right? Same is for every single group on the periodic table except for this group here, group 18 or 8A. Very, very special group, all right? Um, if I look at these, okay, group eight, I can't say that they all have two electrons in their outer shell because that's incorrect. And I can't say that they've all got eight because that's incorrect. When I talk about the group eight, 8A elements or group 18, all right, noble gases, they're actually what every single other element wants to become. Every other element is jealous of these guys, and that's because they have a full valency shell. All right, every atom's goal in life is to fill their valency shells and make them full. These guys have already done that. First shell can only ever hold two, bang, it's got two in it already. Second shell can only hold eight valence electrons, bang, it's got two, eight in there. Same with the third one, eight, same with the fourth one eight, all right? Now I do know that the shells hold more than those, but they only hold a maximum of eight valence electrons, all right? So let's talk about one last thing, and that's valency. Okay, so valency, what's valency? Let's get rid of this for a minute. All right, so what is valency? All right, so when we talk about the valency of an atom, we're talking about what it is likely, its likely net charge is. So group one atoms, you saw that they had one valence electron, all right? That means it's really easy for them to give away one valence electron to make a full shell, all right? So they're more likely to give one away than attract seven. So their valency or their charge, once they give away that electron is plus one. So their valency is plus one, all right? 
bring this in here. So group one, they're going to have a valency of plus one. Okay, group two, two valence electrons. Again, easier to give away those two than attract six. So they're going to give those two electrons away, which means they have a net charge of plus two. Their valency is plus two. Again, when I come through to the other side, um, group 6A, all right, got six valence electrons. They're going to attract two. They're not going to give away um, six. So when they attract two extra electrons, they have a net charge of negative two. Their valency is negative two. Um, group 7, um, got seven valence electrons. Gonna, um, They're going to take on one extra electron to make a full valency shell. When they take on an electron, they take on an extra negative. Negative one is their net charge. So they have a valency of negative one. And our group 18 or 8A, they have a full valency shell, all right? They're not gonna give away or attract electrons because they've already done their job. They've already got a full outer shell. Um, we'll talk about group four, a here, which is uh, carbon and silicon, all right? Very, very special group. They're number four, which means they've got four valence electrons. So they can attract four, or they can give away four just as easy, all right? It is the reason why all, um, we say that um, Earth, all right, all life on Earth is carbon-based, and it's because of the properties of carbon and the way that it can bond to virtually anything else. All right, and that is because it has it has those four valence electrons. All right, um, so just quickly going over things, what did we look at today? We looked at our three types of atoms, which are our non-metals, our metals, and our metalloids. All right, we looked at the groups and the periods and why an atom look is in a group or a period, and we've looked at valency. All right, your valency is what we class as the net charge. All right. Um, that's it for now. Hope to see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye.